Good evening, everybody. Chip Cooper for FTC Guardian and my partner, Alan Cuts. Here we are, January 2018, the first hangout for the year. We're ready to go. We had a nice holiday. I'll speak for myself. I already talked to, all, to Alan. He had a good one, too. He can tell you that in just a second. But uh, we got through this one without a whole lot, without an excess of drama. There was some drama, but we yeah. got through it. There always is drama at Christmas. Very little, if any, drama at Thanksgiving. That's why I like it so much. But we got through it. Everything's fine. The grandchildren love their presents. Everything's good. So uh, now we're looking forward to a very busy early start to the year. We've got a couple of big events we're coming up that are coming up for us. Uh, the cruise, the marketers cruise and traffic and conversions. Things are really getting off to a big start here early in the year. And I'm going to see what Alan was is willing to share with you about. This. <laughs> yeah. So, guys, have you ever said to yourself, I want to do something, but ah. I'm too old to do that. I, I'm too old to start to try to learn how to do that. Well, I've been going through that since I was probably in my late twenties. I and I, I grew up on a you know on a ranch, as most of you probably know and everything. And my one of the things my mom did was she you know made sure that she kind of worked on the softer side, like she made me take piano lessons and organ <laughs> lessons. And I learned I played in the sixth and sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. I played the trombone and and as long as well as playing football. But I did that. Well, I'd always wanted to learn how to play the guitar. And I've never done it. So for Christmas, I bought myself. Oh, my gosh. Is it, you're not going to play a song for us, are you? A steel guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm taking my own lessons. I'm taking lessons. I'm going to learn how to play the steel guitar or learn how to play the guitar. I've, uh, I've decided that I'm not. I, I was sitting in church. and I'm tired of watching all these guys play. And I was like, I got to learn how to play that daggum thing. So. <laughs> So I decided to pick it up and uh, learn how to play the guitar. So if you know how to play and you got special tips, send them my way because I'm the uh, I'm in the learning mode, working on my fingers, getting my fingers all uh, calloused, basically. Uh, so I'm in my second week of uh, taking lessons uh, every day. I uh, taking you know working on it. So if you've got any One special of my tips, favorite, uh, I guess uh, Texas blues songs is Little Wing. Little Wing, yeah, <laughs> that's a yeah. tough one. Yep, to see yep. if, uh, say uh, by early spring or summer, he's well, ready to give us a little. Re ready to give it a give it give it a go. So before we get started, what I want to tell, remind everybody: you should up in the upper right hand corner, you should see a little yellow box, and it says, "If you have questions, make sure you click the little chat button." If, if you just chat, it's chat. But if you have a specific question, make sure you mark it as a question in that chat. Do the little drop down. There's like three little dots there. Uh, and it says, uh, make it a question or something like that. Uh, do that so that we know that it's a question versus just chit chat. Uh, makes it easier for me to follow when we, uh, when we do have questions. So do that. And, um, that's really about it. We're, we've got a big, we've got a lot planned for the, for the new year. So, uh, we're glad you're here and, uh, we look forward to, to serving you in, in 2019. Wow. Never, it just seems, yeah, time flies. So I guess we're ready to start, right? You're you're ready? I'm ready. Let's go. All right. Then we're going to do a share my screen and we should be able to see the title slide there. Can you see that? Yep. Okay. So we see the California Consumer Privacy Act of 2018, known by the acronym CCPA, also known by a number of attorneys calling it GDPR Lite. And it's effective almost exactly a year from now, January 1, 2020. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking that uh, we just after 2018, when we devoted a, a significant amount of time covering GDPR, you're probably a little bit weary of privacy and data security. I know I am. Um, and you here we go again, it seems. But let me tell you, before we even jump past this uh, title slide, I really think the vast majority of you are not going to be subject to it. So that's the good news, but you still need to know what the basic parameters are and ex exactly whether or not you are subject to it, at least in its current form. So let's get started and uh, go through this as quickly as possible. Um, here you see the housekeeping announcement you've seen a number of times. The presentation is for informational purposes only. It is not legal advice 
and we're not affiliated with the FTC. So this is CP, CCPA in a nutshell. More on it in future slides, but here we go. Um, it's privacy legislation passed by the California legislature back in June of, tw of 2018 last year, set to, to take effect on January 1, 2020. And it's a moving target because it's in the process of being edited, updated, revised as we speak. I'll explain how that works in just a minute. And it potentially applies to any business, particularly any online business that markets to or collects personal data from Californians. Again, I think most of you will not be subject to it. Again, more on that in just a minute or two. And, and as you know, it's often referred to as GDPR light. Now, this is, this is very uh, unusual in, in terms of how the state of California works uh, with respect to legislation in the, for California. Uh, they have, you can see below there, they can have a direct vote, essentially a referendum or a plebiscite as you, as you may, uh, whatever you want to use to describe it, where a new law is presented to the people. And you can see here, I'm not going to go into the detail of it, but there was this uh, legislation proposed as a referendum last year. And it obviously being uh, involved in privacy and data security had a huge impact potentially on high tech businesses. And guess what? California is the leader uh, in this country in terms of high tech businesses. And so they started pushing back. And so as a result, then uh, the state legislature passed the law very close to the end of the legislative session. And the way things work in California, if the law had passed through the direct vote, the referendum, there would be no modifications or updates to it. However, if it's passed by the legislature, the legislature can make changes and updates to it up until the time it's supposed to go into effect, which of course is 1120. So this is a, a clip of one of the flyers put out by some leaders in the technology industry. Don't sign the petition don't vote for this new privacy law. And then I just explained how all of it sort of turned out. So here are the basic rights that California residents would have under the CCPA if it continues in its present form. Number one, the right to know what information is being collected from them. Two, uh, to know if their personal information is being sold or disclosed and to whom. Number three, the right to say no to the sale of their personal information, four, the right to access, access their personal information, and five, the right to equal service and price even if they exercise their privacy rights. In other words, don't be penalized if they exercise their privacy rights with respect to the use of maybe online services. And very similar to these rights, the California residents may request the following, what information is being collected, the sources that it's being collected from, the business purpose for the collection, whether the information is sold and for what purpose, and the third party recipients of the data. And then there's some limitations here on requests by Californians, not to exceed two times in a 12 month period, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's sort of a very quick summary of the basic uh, rules. Now we get to enforcement and penalties. Um, and it's interesting, the California Attorney General can impose fines of up to $750 per person per violation. So if you got, you know, there's an example here in that second bullet under number one, if you got 1300 customers uh, as consumer customers, it could result in a $1 million fine. So it adds up in a hurry. And very interesting there in point two in this slide, there's no requirement for evidence of loss of money or property claims under the statute can be made simply based on the loss of privacy. And one of the, one of the general rules or concepts or principles in the law is you're not going to be able to sue somebody and recover damages if you cannot prove in monetary terms what you've been damaged. You might be able to prove liability, but if you cannot prove that you were actually damaged financially, 
in a measurable way, you're not going to re recover anything. That's a general principle. However, this statute departs from that principle and says you don't have to prove any pecuniary or financial loss. It's just that your privacy was damaged in some way and you, you can recover. And if that continues, if that concept continues, then you should expect, as the era points out, a huge uptick in lawsuits, including class actions, because you don't have to prove damages. So this is a big one uh, and one that should be of concern to every business that might be covered. Now, here's where you need to really focus on this slide, because this provides the compliance thresholds and will help you answer the question of whether, it, at least in terms of the way the statute is presently uh, drafted, whether it would apply to you, whether it would regulate you and your business. Now, number one, a for-profit business that meets one of the following three things, right? So I'm sure that everybody listening to me and who uh, listens to the replay video is in a for-profit business, or at least the vast majority, right? So number one, do you have annual gross revenues of at least $25 million? Probably not. <laughs> I would like to know if there are members of FTC Guardian that have revenues of at least $25 million and up. We all aspire there. We all aspire to grow businesses, but we're not there yet. So remember, you're going to be regulated if one of the following applies to you. So number one, probably would not apply uh, to the vast majority. Number two, alone or in combination annually, you buy, receive, sell, or share for commercial purposes, personal information of at least 50,000 consumers or households or devices. So that might apply, but probably would not apply uh, to most of you, Re buys, receives, sells, or shares co for commercial purposes, personal information of 500 consumers, right? And then number three, your business generates 50% of your annual income from sales of personal information. So you need to be able to not answer any oh, yes to any of those three questions or points and if none of them apply, then this statute as it's presently drafted would not apply to you. So I think when you boil all of this down, probably very few of you are going to be regulated by this statute, but you should at least have, if even if you're not regulated, uh, and certainly by the time it goes into effective, which of course it might be changed at that point, at least you should understand what's involved uh, as, you, as you conduct your business. So one other thing I forgot to mention here, if you look on the left side with the uh, yellow text, you can see that points number two and number three really are targeting data aggregators and data brokers. Very few, if any of our members are going to fall into that category of a data aggregator or data broker. This statute really, um, uh, sort of departs from GDPR a little bit because it's really focusing on the buying and selling of personal information, right? And that's what data aggregators and brokers are all about. So uh, points two and three are really focusing there. Again, probably not very many of you, if any, are going to fall into this, those two categories that I doubt anybody will fall under number one. So let's look at data aggregators and data, data brokers here in a minute. And this is a a graphic taken from the FTC website. And if you look at the very top, near the top, you see these arrows pointing to a data broker that the red, the, no, the blue arrow points to. And if you look at the top, you'll see data brokers, online stores, website stores, companies and local governments, all are collecting personal information about you. And many, if not all of those are selling this personal information to data brokers who then combine it and aggregate it with other data from any or all of these sources and then resell it to advertisers. That's what data brokers do. And that's where this statute is pretty much uh, targeting. And here is a classic example of how data is uh, collected now. 
we know that there are a lot of terrific free, and I'm saying free in quotes, services on the internet. Uh, Gmail for one. Uh, another would be uh, Facebook, where we don't have to pay a fee for Gmail or, or for use of the Facebook platform, but we're giving up our personal information uh, for in exchange for the free use of the service, right? Now, uh, Google and Facebook are not buying and selling your information. They're just acquiring it from you and using it to serve you ads, right? But they're smaller and there are other, uh, there are other sources that collect this information, which would be, as we see in this prior slide, that fall into those categories that collect it and then sell it, right? And this is the classic example, the so-called free weather app. And if you look here, you can see that the sign up for the installation of this so-called free app on your phone is requesting that it have access to the following types of information about you, the device, the app history, your identity, accounts, profile data, that sort of thing, and all of your photos, media, and media files, right, and files. And so we ask this question over in the right margin, is this data necessary? for a weather app to function. And the only one that we can say yes to would be the one highlighted in yellow for location. Obviously, a weather app to need, needs to know where you are to give you weather for that location, but it doesn't need your device and app history and identity and profile data and, and photos and media and other file data. That's the information they're collecting about you that they sell and, and make money. That's what they do. So this is a classic example and this is what the GDPR light is primarily focusing on. All right, so to follow up, the CCPA has a basic regulatory message, and that is we're going to depart now, at least in terms of what California believes about privacy and data security, from this model that we have been using, that the industry has been using for a number of years uh, they want to change this model a little bit, which is the model involving free online services in exchange for personal data. That's what's been driving the internet for a fairly long time. And this statute wants to change that a little bit. It's called the privacy model, where uh, you're collecting all sorts of data about people, and they are supposed to look at your privacy policy to determine how you share it and use it, but very few people do. And there's really, it's just an open season on sharing and selling data. It's done uh, extensively under this so-called privacy model or free online services in exchange for data. So now the Californians decide to uh, really update privacy controls and to change this free uh, online services for data model and um, this is what it's really all about. This is the basic regulatory message. So it's important, I think, to understand who's going to be impacted in a meaningful way. We know that data aggregators and data brokers and anyone who's collecting the data at the bottom end, like the, the owners of that weather app, are going to be impacted, right? But Facebook and Google, are not gonna really be impacted at all because they are closed ecosystems. They don't sell or share your data outside of their own universe, right? Uh, and so they're just collecting data about you in order to sell uh, uh, ads back to you. They don't start taking that data about you and selling it to a data broker. So they are really not affected and you don't see them complaining about the new statute or lobbying California and the legislature to change it. They already have decided that they are not going to be uh, really a target of this legislation, but the smaller companies, particularly those that are involved in data collection, aggregation, data brokers for the sale, the, buy, the purchase and sale of personal information, they are the ones that are going to be affected. Um, Another thing I think you need to understand is we're talking, of course, about the California legislature and regulators in the legislature who are very passionate about privacy, right? And they've passed this legislation going into effect 1120. But what does the FTC have to say, right? This, 
This statute has nothing to do with the FTC. This is the state of California. However, it impacts anybody that satisfies one of the three criteria we talked about who would be selling into uh, to California or collecting data from California residents. So it has a wide reach, even though it's really a, a California statute, the way GDPR works. It's a, a European statute of the, uh, of the EU. And if you're collecting information from European uh, residents, then it, you can be regulated. And that's the same concept as far as jurisdiction here. But what does the FTC have to say? I think you'll be surprised. As indicated in number one here in November, the FTC issued some comments generally about privacy. And number two, it's surprising a little bit that the FTC said in those comments that they favored a balanced approach that protects both privacy and innovation, right? And uh, they're worried about uh, too much privacy regulation might negatively affect innovation and competition which is what we're involved in. Our members are selling products and services online. And the FTC is saying, if we go too much to the extreme in privacy protection, we're going to essentially kill the goose that laid the golden egg, which is the internet and the commerce that has been flowing so freely in the last few years. And you see in number three, uh, the FTC actually stated that it could result in the loss of advertising funded online content, right? Meaning, you know, uh, the free use of online services that are supported by ads, right? Like Facebook and, and Google and a number of others. So it's interesting and somewhat refreshing to see that the FTC is taking a balanced approach to privacy. They're worried if we're gonna go too far down the extreme end of the spectrum to to Uber protection for privacy, we could be damaging the economic system that we have that allows uh, free uh, online content uh, and which is advertising function, uh, uh, advertising funded. And so the FTC is a little bit concerned about California's uh, propensity to regulate and maybe other states would follow suit. So I think what the FTC is saying here is We'd certainly like to see the federal government, U.S. Congress, come up with something that would preempt uh, the state statutes, including California, and provide a more balanced approach. That's what I think the FTC is saying, and it's quite refreshing. And it's very rare that we believe that the FTC is refreshing because they really come down so hard on marketers who don't toe the line as far as their regulations are concerned. So. In conclusion, the following takeaways, uh, the legislation's passed, passed the legislature and will go into effect 1120. We should expect amendments. And here are these compliance thresholds again. One of them has to apply or you're not regulated. You've gotta be a for-profit business. You've gotta either have annual gross revenues of at least $25 million, or you're gonna be involved in the trafficking of a lot of personal information uh, from selling, buying, sharing, that sort of thing, uh, as, as indicated uh, in points two and three. And if none of those apply, you're not regulated, at least now. And you see the last bullet there in red. Stay tuned because this thing is going to change a little bit. And we're going to try to stay up with that and keep you apprised of those changes throughout the year. However, we promise not to dominate our coverage in these hangouts with respect to uh, this this California legislation, the way we did for GDPR. We had 10 hangouts devoted to GDPR. We're probably going to have one or two maybe uh, for this California statute in order to keep you up with how it might change between now and the end of this year. So here are the tags that will be uh, searchable California Consumer Privacy Act, which is the name of the statute, CCPA, GDPR, Privacy Data Broker and Data Aggregator. All right, I'm going to kill the screen screen share, and I think uh, I can see Alan. I hope yep. Alan can see me. So do we have any questions? Yeah, um, question from uh, Phil. 
would the compliance threshold of 50,000 consumers uh, devices mean California people or 50,000 throughout the world? I believe it's California people. California, so I thought so. It's, it's all, yeah, it's specific to 50,000 in California. So that's why we're saying it's not going to affect very memory. You've got to do a lot of stuff in California specifically yeah. in order for to, a lot of business just in California to, to accept you. But be uh, aware that the high tech businesses, which, which are the backbone of the California economy are going to be, you know, they're going to, they're going to be looking for some changes so that it doesn't impact their businesses quite to the extent it might have as it was originally drafted. So we're going to have, technology friendly or technology business friendly changes as we move through the year and we'll keep you updated on that. Yeah. Uh, and, and James, I see your question about webinar, uh, you know, the, the slides weren't changing. A lot of that has to do with the bandwidth on your side because I mean, Chip and I are in different locations and the slides change fine. I, you know, I, I agree that, 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 that webinar jam uses more resources than a lot of other stuff than like uh, go to webinar and we use go to webinar a lot as well but this works out really well for our member only hangouts because we can automatically upload it heck it's already automatically uploaded to youtube so all we have to do is put a link into a membership area um since we're done so that's the reason we use it it works really well for our member only hangouts uh it's about the only time we really use uh, webinar jam uh james uh I like webinar jam, so I guess it's matter of opinion. Yeah, it really, uh, it really does. It, hard to buck on matter uh, webinar jam. Yeah, it just really depends about your bandwidth is really what it amounts to. Uh, if I use a provider for a service and they collect and sell some of the data they collect for over fifty thousand people, uh, does that put me over the compliance threshold, or is it only the provider? Okay. Well, I'll tell you so what. If, yeah, look at Phil. Phil's up there. He's on the top one. Yeah, I'm going back on the slides to refresh okay. myself. I'm, I'm looking at points number two and number three. There's no well, there's no need. I can put them up here again. Going to see if I if I use there. if I use a provider for a service and they collect and sell some of the data, they collect. So really we're talking about points two and point three, right? Alone or in combination, annually buys, sells, rece receives, sells or shares personal information of 50,000 consumers. The combination might involve this platform you're talking about, right? Alone or in combination, I think it means with others, right? Yep. So, so I believe that one might possibly result in coverage by you. I don't, and, I, obviously you would know if you're generating 50% of your annual uh, revenue from personal information sales of California residents. So I think the one, number one doesn't apply. Number three doesn't apply. Two might, depending on this combination thing, but we'll, we'll update this more as we go along. But I think the one that might uh, involve you is that second one, if you can read it there. Yeah. Right. Uh, and somebody else have a question while you're on that slide. Does number three affect affiliate marketing and traffic generation? Generates 50% of annual revenue from personal information sales. I think in order for three to apply, you've got to be selling personal information the way a broker would sell personal information. Right. Um, and if you're, if you're involved in affiliate sales, you're not selling information unless you actually are selling information and you wouldn't be as an affiliate. Yeah. So, so I mean, again, remember they're talking about aggregators and brokers here primarily yeah, yeah. two and three. And so uh, an affiliate marketer would not be, uh, have to worry about number three, unless you actually are selling personal information. Yeah. I mean, you guys, I mean, you think about, they're talking about companies like exact data, Experian. Uh, I mean, companies that I buy, I buy data from. Alan I mean, deals with this all the time. He yeah. does advertising for his clients and for our. I'm on. Broker. I am on the phone every single day with a data broker. Every single day. With some know, data broker somewhere. Data, I mean, it's a commodity, right? Your right. data that somebody collected and then transferred and aggregated into all these data sets, and yep. then in turn is resold 
to Alan for ad purposes for his clients and for yep. MTC Guardian. So um, people buy and sell data all the time. Certain people do. I don't. Yeah. But those are the people, those are the businesses that this statute is focused on. I really yep. think you have no concern there for number three. Yep. Uh, and this is Christina. Will you guys still keep us up to date with GDPR for Europe? Yes, absolutely. As things change and it's going to evolve, I believe that, you know, probably is not as much this year, but I believe in the year 2020 is we're going to see it evolve a lot more in Europe because we're going to see the U.S., California get involved. And I, I really see the whole thing kind of starting to eventually come together where Europe and the U.S. and we kind of all start to have this talk about data and what we can actually collect, you know. Uh, so yeah, we're going to keep everybody up to date with GDPR as it relates to Europe and stuff like that. Um, yeah. I mean, we're here to cover the legal developments affecting online businesses. Yeah. When we started FTC guardian back in 2014, that was focusing on the FTC regulation. Right. But since then we've got, you know, some tax laws that we've covered, uh, a U.S. Supreme court decision back in uh, the summer. Uh, we've got GDPR, which we had to cover in great detail. We've got this, which we're not going to devote a huge amount of time to unless we see changes that really going to affect our members. And right now we're telling you we don't think that's going to happen, but we're going to keep you know, checking it and we're going to keep you updated. So yep. the scope of what we do now here far exceeds simply uh, FTC regulation. It is, it is in, increased into regulation that really affects who our members are. Yep. Yep. Um, that's, that's what we're talking about. But we don't think this is going to be a major factor, certainly not to the level of GDPR. So we're not yeah. turning all these hangouts into privacy discussions. Right. So, but right. we'll keep you updated on GDPR and this as it goes along. Yep. Uh, first, says, give a website or e com example that block showing up in EU. I don't. One, I don't quite understand the question and how do they do it? Uh, oh, oh you're, are you talking about how do you block a website? Oh, that's pretty simple. And, and, and again, I say it's simple. It's simple in that you can do it. But if the person is using an IP ghost like I do most of the time when I'm doing a lot of stuff, I'm doing research and I'm doing a, using a, an IP software that gives me IPs from different categories. I mean, somebody could be in Europe and using a... Uh, I forgot mine's called IP coach or IP something. I forgot what the name of it's, what, what it's called. And I can get an Atlanta IP address or I could get a Philippine IP address. And you know, when you do what I do, you have to do that because you have to test something. So if I throw up a web page and I want to say, I want to see what it looks like from somebody who's logging in from the UK because I've got it, it's an advertorial and it might say Australia on the page. I got to see what it looks like. So I use those, you know, different, uh, IP uh, cloaking things to do it. But if somebody over there is using one of those type of things, you can't block them. I mean, you can't do it. But if you just want to block out IP sets, absolutely. That's that's super, super easy to do. Um, yeah, you, okay. you, can, you can easily block out European IP sets if you want to. Uh, but I don't see any need to. I really don't see any need to do it at all. Uh, Christina, uh, uh, Christina says, uh, Alan, are you with this daily aggregated brokers and blah, blah, blah. Uh, can you assist us in getting leads? Yeah. I mean, email support, email Molly at support and just uh, she'll set up a point. If you're, if you're serious about uh, lead gen and that kind of stuff, then email Molly and she'll give you a link where you can set an appointment with me and we can chat. Uh, again, it's honestly, it's, it's, it's one of the phone calls I have every single day. Cause I'm always, you know, negotiating, trying to buy leads and whatever that is. So anyway, it's out there. Yeah, uh, pretty good at that. Uh, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll, yeah. Well, I mean, there's a lot you can do with it. There's just, there's just so much. These days, there's so much you can do. It's not like it's just the lead. It's so much more than just the lead itself. There's so much you can do with it. Uh, in addition to my GDPR question, uh, how do you think the current status of Brexit situation is going to affect the GDPR? Whoa. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, that's a really, a really good question. Yeah. But Sort of above and outside of my area of expertise about 
speculating about how Brexit is again. Going. I think it's, I think it's it, the challenge is it's speculation, and that's the the yeah. I, the challenge yeah. is all but speculation. If I had a background in that area, I would spec. I would say you know I like to speculate about things from time to time, but this is you know I only speculate about things that I feel like I'm knowledgeable enough to speculate about and i'm not knowledgeable i'm vaguely i probably know about what you know about brexit it, it, yeah. at best. in fact you may know more so yeah uh, i'm not qualified that's the reason i can't give you an answer all right well i think we're uh i think we're good so right. um, yeah i mean we're we're on we're 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 into 2019 we've got this date set the next date do you remember what the next date is i know it's in the email that christina or somebody sent out so, because we're going on the marketer's cruise, the very yeah, is it after the cruise or before the cruise? I think it's after the cruise. Hang on, I'm, I'm gonna look real quick. I'm gonna put my calendar up and see. Let me put my calendar up. <laughs> I don't remember. I I've got so many. Well, when like, are the emails going out? What's that? Have the emails already gone out? Oh yeah, the emails have already started going out. Um, Somebody's sending those. Yeah, those are already going out. I just don't remember what the dates are. I, I just once I task it, I don't have to remember it anymore. Yeah, I've got I've got my the twenty. It's the week. It's the week of the week. The week that we leave. It's the twenty second. Okay, on yeah, Tuesday, twenty second Eastern, right? Yeah, at eight o'clock Eastern, right? Twenty second. DPR or it's not privacy. We're getting back into the stuff that I really enjoy more. Which yeah. Is the regulation, advertising, all of the things that you're probably more interested in. And yeah. we're going to be along those lines for a number of uh, hangouts to come. In fact, I yeah. And Christina, I'm going to, I'm going to throw it out there. I mean, it, it's a little bit late. I would think for most people to go on the cruise, the cruise happens every year. Uh, usually uh, it's, it's called the marketers cruise. Uh, it's usually happens the end of January to the first week of March. It used to be a little earlier in March, or excuse me, a little earlier in January, but they backed it off a little bit now where it runs usually the last week of January, something like that. And uh, where there's 400 to 450 folks from all over the globe, literally all over the globe, uh, that fly in to go on the cruise, uh, the marketer's cruise, and everybody's, everybody's in internet marketing. You know, we all, some of them have, uh, businesses. We've got a lady who comes every year from Belgium that sells chocolate. Uh, we've got people from coming from down under from Australia that, you know, sell uh, infrared, infrared stuff, you know, massage stuff. Uh, there are just people from all over. We've got a lady who comes in from Washington that chops down trees. I mean, she does big trees. She's a logger and she makes wood. That she cuts it, trims it and makes stuff. I mean, matter of fact, one year she brought everybody one of these are for the 10th anniversary. She had these. I mean, I mean, the purpose of it really yep. is, is network. Yep. I mean, it's all about networking. Boil it down. It's networking, but it's also having fun while you're networking. Yep. It's quite different. If you go to some of these events where they're, you know, you, you take your business cards and you meet people over a weekend of two or three days, all these presentations going on. It's it's hard to really get to know somebody like that. You know, you're, you're handing out business cards and you're trying to figure out a way to begin some kind of relationship, maybe. Right. Yep. On the cruise for a week, you go on these excursions and you paddle down this river or you go snorkeling and you can really get to know somebody when you have lunch with them for two or three days and snorkel with them and then uh, hang out at three in the morning, drinking beer and eating pizza and talking about them some more. So it's a great opportunity to network and also have some fun too. It's really, yeah. but I mean, it, and so you guys know FTC guardian was born That's out of the marketers cruise. That. We got together. We decided to form FTC guardian on a cruise at the end of 2014. Yeah. The marketers okay. cruise. We met each other a couple of three times at some events and masterminds. So we knew each other, but we finally said, Hey, let's, let's talk about, doing something here specific yep. and it, it led and this is a lot of businesses have been formed. Yeah. Yeah. Result of network. Yeah, I, I remember we chatted in 2013 because I think we were in the mastermind together in 2012, 2013. We chatted about what you were doing and da, 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 da. We went back and forth about it. And then in 2013 on the cruise, we talked about it a little bit and you were, you were trying to go, you were going different ways with what you were doing and you think you did something. 
And then 2014 is when we kind of got together and said, let's just do this. And that was like in January of 2015. Uh, the first day as we were pulling out of the port, I believe in Miami, headed to the Bahamas all around. And I was sitting up on the top deck at the Serenity deck where yeah. they don't allow kids and there's a bar and it's real quiet. And I was sitting there sort of thinking about what I wanted to do uh, during the week, you know, the coming week of the cruise. I said, you know, I'd like to really find a partner and, and see if we can't, you know, work together to create some stuff. And not long after that, here comes Cuts walking by. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Fine, fine. He said, you know, we ought to talk about doing I said, really you serious? <laughs> I couldn't believe it because I was just sitting there thinking about that would be something that would be, you know, that I was looking for. And it just happened right within 20 minutes or 30 minutes of thinking about it. He just stops by and says, why don't we have uh, breakfast tomorrow morning or something and let's talk about doing it. So it's just a great opportunity yep. to, to network. It works very well with a lot of people, including yeah. us. Yeah, because it, it, it's unforced. It's not like going to a networking event where networking is forced and it's not, uh, and it's open where you can, you, you, I go with my wife. Chip used to go with his wife. His wife hasn't been going the last couple of years, but, and I go with my wife. And um, so you go to as many activities as you want. You go to the parties and you, you, you get to spend real time with real people that's not so forced. And it's, it's just, a, it's, it's a comfortable networking uh, event and you can talk business as much as you want to talk business or as little as you want to talk business. And uh, it makes it a lot of fun. So if you haven't done it, it's something you should put on your list of things to do. Um, I, have gone now, I think, I think I'm in my 12th year. I, I think, think so. I'm in my seventh or eighth, but yeah, don't get us wrong. We're not trying to sell you. We don't oh, yeah, get no. commissions here, but we like the cruise. It's been good for us. It's been good for people we know and work with. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah. But, but but I was going to say this. I forgot it just for a second. Every year that I've been involved, and I believe the three or four years prior to my getting involved in it, it's always been somewhere in the Caribbean. I mean, and, and after a while, you, you keep going to some of the same places, right? So this year, we're all you've been at 12 times like I have. <laughs> going to the West Coast, I've never been to, you know, the, the Mexican Riviera. Never yeah. been there. So yeah. there's going to be an interesting change this year. And I, I would assume they're probably going to continue that for several years and then come back. Who knows? Yeah. Anyway, yeah. yeah. It's so, uh, well, it's, it's strange because I have gone so long. I mean, I, I have gone now it's so long that I get the same room. My wife likes the room that we get. That's the reason we, we get it. Uh, we get the same room and it's not always the same ship, but the ships are always the same class of ship. I think it's what they call them. So they have the same basically room makeup. So we get the same room every year. I mean, it's the I mean, it's not always the same number. Oh, it's the same look, room look every look year. Turn, so you can see where you've been, right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's really on the not. back of the ship. On the usually as much as much as possible on the right hand side. If you're looking to the back of the ship, uh, on the on the well, I don't even know if it's a starboard side. I don't even know if it's a starboard or port side. Uh, on the one side, it's a corner sixth floor. Corner corner room, so we have a really really big deck, so my wife can spend a lot of time on the deck and chilling and stuff like that. But we've 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 had the same room for ten years, I think. <laughs> I, don't I don't know where I'm going to be. I just, I just... <laughs> yeah yeah. All right, guys. Uh, okay. More love to have you next year. We'll tell you all about it after the cruise where we're going in 2020. I I always book. I book and pay for my trip. I, on, on this trip for next year that way it's on my calendar i don't have to think about it anymore it's already over with and i just i put the deposit down and and book it and yeah, i mean we'll we'll give you plenty of information about how to sign up uh, for next yeah, year. yeah 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 but yeah it, it'd be something it's, to be worth your, it's worth your while and if you have a spouse or something who wants to go it really is i mean i'm not a cruiser this is the only cruise i go on this is the only one and i don't particularly like cruises but this one is an exception. My wife can relax and totally, totally relax, not do anything. She doesn't have to go to the Lido decks and stuff, but we have a really big deck ourselves. So she does what she wants to do so she can chill. We can go to dinner at night if we want to and go to hike, you know, go to the steakhouse or go to a nice restaurant or do whatever or not do anything. So it, it's as much or as little as you want, which makes it nice. Uh, but anyway, we'll tell you more about that if you're really, really interested and in be a part of the cruise uh, for 2020. But 
anyway, that's it for tonight. Okay. Um, okay, guys, have a good evening. We appreciate your attendance. We're going to have a great year this year. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.